Thanks for being here and also thanks to uh, QC for the support. It wasn't directly for this paper, uh, but it's kind of continuing the agenda. In fact, it, it just got accepted uh, uh, for publication, but I'm happy to share it with the hope that it will sort of foster conversation uh, uh, going forward for some uh, uh, offshoot projects that we have in mind. So actually there is, uh, as the title suggests, we look at ancient data and there's someone at least who knows what we are talking about, Goiko Bayramo, which is a faculty at Harvard Near Eastern Languages and Culture. So uh, three, three economists and one historian. Um, what we did is um, we started by constructing this ancient data set uh, going 4,000 years ago, the Bronze Age, 2000 BCE. And then, uh, then we thought, okay, what do we do with this data set? Well, one of the uh, 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 standard statistical uh, uh, models of trade is something we all know very well, gravity. Um, so objects that are near are more related uh, uh, to each other than objects that are far apart. Uh, so just take uh, a celestial gravity, uh, what, what you know as the Newtonian gravity, uh, the relationship between objects I and J uh, is increasing in their size and decreasing in the distance between them. So replace here N with trade flows and the size uh, with the GDP of uh, any economic unit, city or county, I or J, uh, you get a pretty good fit from this relationship. So all these observables here uh, explain about 70% of trade flows at any level of geographic aggregation. So we start with this well-known um, um, fact, but then in our case, a lot of these things are not observable by virtue of uh, uh, how ancient the data is. Um, not only do we not know the size of the cities, neither their populations nor obviously their GDP, but we also don't know, for some of them, where they are located. So distance is just a function of coordinates. So uh, a lot of those right-hand side things are unobservable. So what we do is we invert this relationship and try to use the data set that we construct to maximize the fit to explain those observables. So let's try to locate lost cities, and let's try to uh, uh, estimate the size of these cities. So that's, that's the idea. Now, and so can you say the trade data set tells you it's between this city and that city? Yeah. And you don't always know where this is at. Right. Some of them, w so you need to know, right, you need to have some anchors. We actually know most of them, but a subset of them are mentioned in the text, but people, uh, historians don't know where they are. I'm going to talk in detail why a city may be lost. What, what does it mean? Now, there are two intellectual precedents to this exercise. One is actually from from physics, uh, so a, a French astronomer observed that there was a perturbation in Saturn's orbit. At that point, they didn't know the next planet, Neptune, so he predicted where exactly Neptune should be and how large it should be. So uh, 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 indeed, when they had the uh, 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 means to, to observe it, they located um, uh, 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 Neptune exactly where he predicted. So it's called the discovery of Neptune with a strike of a pen. Uh, a more recent and, and directly related uh, uh, contribution is a 1971 Nature article by a famous uh, 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 geographer, Walter Tobler and, and, and Weinberg, which basically is, is the same thing on, for this regard, okay, so for this part. So we were pretty excited by our cool idea, but we realized nothing under the sun is, is, is unthought of before. So these guys did actually use a smaller data set so by virtue of several decades, we have more tablets, more ancient data being digitized and available to, to us. So we use more data. We use theory. I'm going to apply, I'm going to emphasize why this is important. And we also do external validity with respect to historians' conjectures and also talk more about the distribution of size of the cities. So what is the contribution? I want to emphasize this bit. This, this kind of is, is, is interesting. Maybe it settles some debates across historians, or they can use this framework to put probability statements of unnamed ruins. So there are lost cities, and there are unnamed sites. So maybe you can construct probabilities for those unnamed sites that are candidate places to be um, one of those cities. So this is really not what we are super excited about. I think the contribution for economists is, is on this front, the distribution of city sizes. 
And there, let me give you a little bit of a background on, on the literature. Um, why, this is, why this is interesting. So there's a debate in economic geography. Um, try to understand what is the driver of the size and the location of cities or industries. Is it local fundamentals, like say climate for cities or certain key commodities? Uh, 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 so most of these are kind of really local fundamentals. Right? And for them to matter in the long run, they should be time invariant and also persistently important. Versus another, uh, another potential explanation is something that mattered in the past, maybe, uh, maybe a, a good ruler, maybe a good mayor, or maybe something that mattered back then, but that doesn't matter anymore, and then has long-term implications because of path dependence, sun costs, and so on, coordination issues. So there are two... Uh, so seminal papers that speak to each of these mechanisms. Uh, people have looked at the Allied bombing of Japan and also uh, in Europe. Uh, many cities were destroyed and then they observed pretty much within two decades uh, cities and their relative ranking, uh, the same for industries, basically came back to where they were before the destruction. So that's taken as evidence for local fundamentals. Now one debate is maybe these shocks are lar not large enough. You destroy the cities but then all the infrastructure, other infrastructure, all the roads that connect them are still there, so there are these gaping holes, so you just go back to those places. Uh, for the path dependent side, there's a really cool paper that actually speaks to our geography here. Um, there is this geological uh, fault line between rivers uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, gaining rapid elevation uh, in the eastern seaboard of US. So Richmond is the best example. James River comes in, and then to uh, navigate further inland, you need to lift the boat up, you need portage. So these, uh, 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 basically like commerce and, and, and supplementary services locate there, so these cities became sort of natural stopping points, marketplaces, and so on. So still, from Richmond to all the way to a bunch of cities in, in Southeast, uh, the map actually uh, pretty much aligns with this, with this fault line. So that's something that didn't matter anymore after the railroad, but these cities uh, stayed where they are. So what we highlight is something that has been kind of overlooked and something that is, in a sense, a local fundamental, but it really is a function of global topology. Um, it is your location vis-a-vis -vis the natural roads. If you Basically, if human beings try to connect longer distances, there are these natural paths, and they intersect in certain places. So these intersections tend to be, uh, we argue, uh, uh, good locations for cities, right? You can sort of travel change horses, stop or travel, or maybe that they become marketplaces where merchants come and meet. Um, so that's kind of what we, what, what we highlight, the intersection of natural roads as a local advantage. So in the interest of time today, I'll skip the model. I'll give you a lot of context. Um, I'll show you the results mostly for this persistence and what explains them, uh, um, but I'll skip the details of them all. So what is the context and the data? 2,000 years before, uh, before common era, the city Asur in northern, day, uh, northern uh, 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 Iraq, modern day northern Iraq, was basically a, a powerful city state, not the Assyrian empire that, that uh, you may know of uh, that grew later. It was a key place for um, sourcing a key commodity, tin, from the east, from, from, era, from Persia and, and Central Asia. And this is Bronze Age, so tin is one of the components of that alloy. This region, Anatolia and Mesopotamia, is lacking tin. It has copper and zinc, but it doesn't have so. So think of this as a key commodity that everybody wanted. These guys were in a good location to source it from the east. What they did, why we have all this data, they became the merchants, they became the sellers, the distributors of tin, together with other commodities in this entire region for the city-states in the entire region. So I'm going to show you 25 cities in a bit, but this is the key city where most of the data is coming from, Kanesh. It it's basically was a metropolis of its day. It still is close to a major city in modern-day Turkey today. So what these guys did is they came up with some institutional innovations as well. So the ruler of, of Asur, uh, which pretty much was uh, a merchant's oligarchy. Um, they allowed free trade, free entry into trading, so no more monopolies. So any, 
any merchant's house could, could, could get a medallion and enter trading. And then they established courts, both in Asur and in Kanesh, to adjudicate between merchants when they have dispute. And they signed lots of treaties with Kanesh and other cities, both to enable transit without uh, uh, ex uh, sort of uh, uh, opportunistic behavior, without extorting tolls, but also getting exclusive rights over trade in this, in this area, in the central Anatolian upper Mesopotamian area. So in a sense, they became um, sort of a multinational enterprise, if you want. They became a large firm, all of these, that had their headquarters in Kanesh for the purposes of trading in Anatolia, and they kept most of their records in that city. So that's why majority of these records, I'm going to show you in a bit how they look like, um, come from Kanesh. Think of this as a, as, a, as a firm or a collection of firms have, say Toyota has headquarters, US headquarters in LA, and you come into those servers, you come into the uh, business records of Toyota within the US. That's, that's kind of the analogy. Um, so tin is what pays for the high cost of this overland trade uh, for supporting the caravans and so on. So you can call this carry, carry along trade once they leave uh, uh, Asur, they put additional commodities, in luxury te textiles, uh, fabrics, and also they do a lot of local trades within these cities in Anatolia. So most of this is basically a 30 year span. We're gonna uh, uh, pull all this, so think of this as a pulled cross section of a generation of traders. Uh, dates are very sketchy. So the, the documents are from Kanesh, in what language are they in? They are in Assyrian. So this is the system of cities um, we are looking at. Um, 15 of those are known, 10 of them are lost, so Kanesh is obviously one of the known ones. So here I'm plotting, your, showing it, or estimates of, of the lost cities as well. Just to give you an idea of um, distances, think of this box here where all these cities are. It's about a 600 by 600 um, kilometer um, box. So that's the size of the geography we are talking about. Now these guys, back then it's not like nobody lived on the Aegean or on the west or somewhere uh, in, in Syria or in the east. It's just this system of cities happened to be the ones that, that the Assyrians tapped into. So we have no records of them trading with, with this site. So obviously when we think about relative size of cities, city size distribution, now large cities are here in the west, but we will be comparing these guys within themselves. So it's going to be sort of within sample comparison so across the, time. Some of the western cities would have traded right. some of the goods past them. Exactly. And there is sort of, there's historical knowledge of that, that there was other trade systems here in Egypt, obviously, in Syria. It's just we are looking at a particular geography. Yes, they like. How do you measure the lost cities? This is, uh, well, so there are many lost cities. This is a subset, this 25, are the ones that are mentioned at least twice in relation to some other city. So take about uh, close to 100 system of cities. A lot of them are just mentioned once, many of them not mentioned in relation to another city. So to estimate this, you need bilateral links. And that kind of network connectivity is an iterative procedure, so you end up with this. Um, Uh, we don't know how prominent they were. So now a city may be lost because it was not prominent. Maybe it's marginal somewhere uh, out of the beaten path. But it could also be lost because it's so prominent it's been continuously inhabited so that it's actually under a continuous settlement in Turkey today. So there's no bias in why a city may be lost. Maybe up until a, a subway line will be constructed, they won't Sounds stumble like upon it. All oh, right, both are biased, <laughs> right, they could be, right. <laughs> and again, when, when a city is unambiguously known, it's because historians have found hard evidence within that city from excavations. Whereas in other ruins, in other places, they haven't found something that says, welcome to this city. Right, so there are unnamed places, there are unlocated names. 
So data is, these are pretty tiny because merchants were actually traveling with these many times. They were shipment documents, they were debt documents, they were warehouse uh, um, uh, bills, warehouse notes. Um, so the content is, they really talk about all this sort of trade going on in, in different ways. Um, as I said, some of them are actually direct shipping bills. So we have an agency relationship. I send something from Asher to, uh, to Charlottesville to, to Leora, and we have a, dunk, we have a caravan uh, uh, taking the cargo, and I don't trust that guy. I give a sealed uh, um, tablet in an envelope uh, to be delivered to, to her. She cracks open it, reconciles the cargo, and pays the cargo, uh, the, the caravan leader. So a lot of them are actually literally uh, uh, shipping bills. They are very small, and they are all over the place in the world. Hundred years of excavations in well-known museums, university libraries. But the nice thing is they've been digitized, yeah. and they again, like w they all somehow came back to Kanesh because they archived them in their warehouses for future disputes, potential disputes. Some of them are promissory notes. So. Again, these guys were mainly had an expat community, their courts, their quarter uh, in Kanesh. So they brought all these things back to today's warehouses, even if one is mentioning trade between other cities. Again, they could carry them around, so they were not, they were not large and heavy. So we don't know Assyrian, obviously, and there are thousands of these tablets. But since these have been digitized and transliterated, if not all of them translated, or co-author could give us the spellings of these cities. So Kanesh, you can recognize here. So the first thing with it is search among thousands of tablets uh, to identify the ones that mention at least two of those cities. This one is a, has a translation. It's talking about a certain shipment from, from one city to another via some other places. This is how they look when they are published. Again, the transliteration here. This actually describes four textiles belonging to someone. Merchants are also named. Um, that some other guy brought from Hahum to Timalkia. So here we have uh, direct evidence for a trade flow from city I to J. And he entrusted it to another guy in Timalkia in the destination, and it's been deposited in the warehouse of some other guy. So one of the potential future projects is actually to look at the merchants' uh, networks. And it's hard to disambiguate the names. Um, it's not clear who is who. There are a lot of similar John Smiths, in a sense. Um, but but that's, that's one of the potential things we are thinking about going forward. All right, so after um, searching the ones and finding uh, the subset of tablets that actually have um, at least two cities, then our co-author read um, the, these ones and disambiguated uh, 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 the spurious ones from, from the non-spurious ones. So think of it this way. LA and New York are two big cities. They, there's a positive chance, there's a high probability that they may be both mentioned in a, in a business document, not because there's a flow between them, just because of their size. Indeed, it turns out that a, a large fraction of these detected tablets are spurious. So he boiled this down to actual flows. Depending, whenever there was some ambiguity, uh, uh, we, we took different cuts, sort of conservative, more liberal, uh, constructed the data in, in multiple ways. Just two cities, so this is automated parsing, uh, just, just automated search. So this example that I was mentioning, you can have two cities mentioned in the same document because it's telling, it's talking about some economic event and there's nothing, it's not a trade flow from I to J, but I and J are both mentioned. So we reduced it to only directed uh, 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 travels, some cargo being shipped, and so on. Well, um, or I don't know how, how often the deliveries would go. And so, what, can you tell us so if you think about the 25 by 24 
matrix of flows. So that's about 600 possible connections. Only 120 of those are positive. So, so informative that you don't think there Right. Any. Zeros are also informative, right? Um, so we're going to use them. But in a sense, it's sparse in the sense, and which is also a future of modern trade data sets. Depending on aggregation, you can have a lot of zeros. And we're going to use well-known techniques to deal with them because they are information. Well, so we do what we can. We count, let, let me describe you a bit more the data. And um, it's basically counts of shipments. So this, this uh, four textiles is, it's not even obvious what four is. So values or prices or cargoes are very, uh, 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 they're very uh, non-systematic. We don't have, uh, hard to have quantities and so on. So we just count shipments. How many distinct itineraries that involve from an I to J flow are there. It's literally a count of tablets or within tablets, sometimes they talk about multiple transactions. Uh, hey, I sent you this from this, and now I'm sending you that. So it's like two. So a shipment is a good? Or a shipment is, it involves goods. It involves... Are you keeping track of what the good is? No. Again, that's very, that's very non unsystematic in the data. I mean, they have, so this, let me, let me answer this with the map. For these 25 cities, which, again, we had to eliminate some because of that network connectivity uh, uh, constraint. So these were places that they had substantial trading, right? So multiple documents are, are, are describing those. So now, if something is... If there's like a small scale cargo that a merchant could just take by himself and there's no reason to generate a record, you're right. I mean, these tablets are expensive to, right, uh, to hire someone to do it and then to, to re um, keep it. So it could be that there were many s very small transactions that are unrecorded, which is more likely to be between nearby cities. That's also true. So there is, in that sense, one can say yeah, that there could be a bias in something being recorded or preserved. I don't know whether they were they were they were all literate, um, or, they so or they had scribes, right? So, so you, so you might be missing like the close right. trades or the people also knew each other better. Right, the right. There could be a bias of missing uh, local trades. And you might only record this stuff if you had some some recourse in case of dispute. or if you are taking by yourself. So again, I'm going to punt on that. Um, so this is to show, although Kanish is, is key, this is not all hub and spoke type of trade. There are a lot of bilateral, the, the thick ones here are uh, links that have more than four uh, ends, these count of shipments. So there are a lot of bilateral trades going on uh, between other cities as well. It's not just Kanish. Um, in relationship to others one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so the model is basically we use a workhorse model of trade, which is a, a competitive model in which each city has a fundamental productivity. So you can think of this as this local fundamental. 
that I was talking about. And it has an exogenous population. This is not a model of um, labor mobility, so we don't, we don't, we don't have that. Um, so each city has a population and productivity. Again, population could be a function of productivity to the extent that this is, say, fertility of the soil in the region and so on. But then, um, given those things and given the location, the probability of city I being the cheapest source city for a demand transaction in destination J is increasing in its productivity, so that's going to lower its cost. It's increasing in its population because it's going to lower its wage, hence its cost. And it's decreasing in the distance between them. So there you have, you have all the flavors of gravity uh, building into that model. Right. So we, we model this. Now, why is it good to have a structural model? As I said, the gravity relationship statistically holds. One can just naively fit all the data into that. There's actually one key use. Let me jump ahead and, well, that's too far. <laughs> I'll, I'll highlight it. It's for estimating the size of the cities um, separate from their locations. So you can be a large city, productive city, but if you are really far away from other large cities, you're going to trade less with everyone else. So you're going to appear less productive from a naive estimation. Or you are central, but you are not that productive. Again, centrality gives you an advantage, right? So we want to purge location from the true size. That's why a structural model um, helps. We parameterize the distance, again, just a function of coordinates. We use Euclidean distance here. We don't use topography yet. We're going to use this in the second stage of trying to understand what drives city sizes. Um, there's a cost of distance. So basically, this model gives you shares of trade. Um, the fraction of imports that J has from I is increasing. Again, it's the population and uh, productivity of I that's decreasing in its uh, distance uh, with respect to the average um, market access of, of city J. Um, yes and no. So first, actually embedding this into this estimation was computationally quite hard. So the whole system is moving at the same time if you bring in sort of an, another interface of, of a least cost path uh, around topography, it really makes it uh, uh, quite challenging. Um, with Euclidean distance, you can get gradients. It's, it's quite amenable, right, for, for estimation. The other thing we wanted to do is to use that information in the second stage to actually see whether our proposed locations are a function of their surroundings. The third thing, what we did at the end is um, for known cities, we actually did simulate these uh, least cost paths. So if there's a detour around a mountain, um, what is the deviation of that from the direct distance? And the correlation was like 0.9. So direct distance in many cases given the size of the geography, is, is explaining 90% of, uh, of the true geographic distance. What is population? What's w? In equilibrium, population affects the wage as well. So higher population lowers the wage, increases the chance that you are the source city. So again, this is now data or counts. This is the model implied moment. So in this, we're going to estimate, uh, so what is unknown here, these things are unknown, parameters of distance are unknown. We will estimate those trying to maximize the fit of these moments to the empirical ones. The first stage we only use known cities to estimate the distance elasticity. This is just a conditional probability, the same thing that I showed you for trades within known cities. This, this bit is, is pretty straightforward. Um, that gives us a distance elasticity that is remarkable, remarkably close to overland modern day trade within Turkey. So I have another paper that uses, again, t uh, a trade within cities in Turkey in, 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 in the modern era, and we get a uh, distance elasticity close to two, um, which is kind of adding to, there's a puzzle in international trade, this distance elasticity is quite persistent over time, 
uh, sort of the, the cost of distance <laughs> hasn't actually come down. Uh, um, people have observed that for the last 100 years, we kind of take another point to 4,000 years ago. Think of this as trade costs are going down, but they're going down in level, not, in, not the slope. We do indeed trade more, but everybody is sort of proportionally trading more with, um, with different distances. Then in second step, we now want to estimate all these unknown, so here are the sizes, these are the sizes of the cities, <coughs> and the coordinates of the lost cities. Known plus one all the way to the end of the data, 10 uh, cities here, two coordinates, 20, one normalization for size, 24 uh, sizes here. Again, we are trying to uh, maximize the fit between the data moments and the, and the empirical moments. So think of this as, uh, the best analogy here is, um, think of sort of three known cities and you have one unknown city. Now think of GPS triangulation, the way satellites locate us is they kind of all predict a certain radius. So all these cities, to the, all these known cities, to how much they trade with the lost city, conditional on their size, which is being jointly estimated, is giving you a gravitational field. So draw that for all the three cities. There's not going to be a unique intersection. It could be a region. Not all three could be uh, uh, overlapping. Right? Again, this is just trying to, to maximize the overall fit. But that's roughly the idea of identification. There's this whole system that you have 15 anchors, 10 things are floating. Together with all the sizes of the 25, you're trying to explain these trade shares. Okay, so I'll give you a flavor of identification at the end by trying to do this, um, like lose known cities fictitiously and see how well this procedure recovers their places. We also did it with modern day cities in Turkey. It does pretty well. Kind of lose, without, lose, without obviously leaving a hole in the middle that, that the algorithm forces you to go, take a bunch of random cities, take the trades between them and, and lose one at a time and see how well you predict it. It does work pretty well. Well, it depends on what kind of city, you'll, you'll see that. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, you actually need the model to, to recover the true size of the city by purging it out of its location. So all these uh, estimated sizes and uh, of this we already have and the locations enables us to back out the fundamental size of the, of the city. So here we need to take values uh, we have to take values from the literature that we cannot identify, assume an internal distance, which is kind of the, um, uh, the hinterland, the immediate hinterland of each city for local trades, and we had this normalization to, s to start with. So 20 coordinates, 24 sizes, so 44 in this stage, in the, in the, in the main estimation. And then the data is 25, 24 trade matrix, which, which is like directional, right? I to J and J, I are J to I are different, but only 120 of those are positive. The zeros are in. Yeah, the zeros are information. Right. right. And uh, we use a version of the Eaton and Corton model that actually does accommodate zeros. Okay, so there are a bunch of results. I'm going to show you maps that are more informative. The key thing in those maps, you're going to see two uh, letters, F and B, uh, by Ramovich and Forladini. So one, one is called or co-author. Another for Lenin is his, his colleague. Historians use a different, more qualitative method to come up with conjectures about where these cities could be. So we're going to use their conjectures as external validity. Um, again, it's not that we say this is the winner, and this is clearly the place, but you can give probability statements at least through the lens of the gravity model to their conjectures. How do they come up with those guesses? 
they actually look at the finer qualitative details that, that we omit. Like say, I'm looking for city uh, B, and in an itinerary, uh, and, and, and city A and C are known. So an itinerary is describing a flow from A to C through B. Well, B has to be sort of in a, if you, if you add a little detour, it has to be in a, in a lens between them. Uh, it won't be way back to the west or east of, of um, the origin and destination. So in a very low-tech version, by reading all these documents and trying to make sense of like ruling out regions for certain cities, uh, both of these historians came up with, with certain locations. In some cases, they agree. These are our distance to, to their conjectures. In some cases, they disagree, and um, I'll show you where we, where we are. Right. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the lost. Oh, these are only the lost ones. You are right. But, but um, I haven't shown you the, the, the 15 known ones. There is one city that is very loosely connected, so it's somewhere in the world. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and then <laughs> it is tiny. So we did actually, I mean, things are robust. The, the persistence results that I will show you later are robust for kicking any city at a time, including this guy. So these shapes are informative about this identification that I mentioned to you. So if, you, if a city is only connected, say, to two cities mainly, um, not only, but, but most of its connections are two cities intensively, then think of like a lens, an elliptic lens that is in the, in the overlap of their gravitational field. That's why these shapes are uh, 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 looking like this. So this city, we located here. BNF agree, it's pretty close. There are cases of success, there are cases of failure, most likely for us. Um, this is one, again, that is close to B, not that far from F. And again, there's nothing in our methodology that biases um, one reading of text versus the other. These are completely two different qualitative and quantitative methodologies. We did do a high-tech version of, of what I described by basically a joint, con like basically lots of joint constraints and let's find the regions that satisfy all of them. And they're actually pretty big. And in many cases they do contain, it's not in the slides but in the paper, they do kind of contain both our estimates and their estimates whenever they are not too far. Um, so basically not a lot of information. Maybe you can put weights. I think the way they read the text is they put more weights to certain uh, itineraries than others. And uh, the way they come up with these sites is it's either an unknown, sorry, it's either an unnamed ruin, as I mentioned, or mostly modern day places, um, like existing towns that, that one historian thinks must be the continuation but of this town. No, it's Kushi is somewhere here. Yeah, right. So B is saying it's, it's, it's Kushi here. Right, um, and we are not too far from it. I mean, this distance is, again, to give you, it's about 13 and 68 to here. This is an important city that uh, historians uh, disagree on. We kind of located closer to where Bayramovich conjectures it to be. Um, again, it's not super uh, well identified in a certain right east-west uh, uh, orientation. This is again an important city that we say is somewhere here in central Anatolia. Both of them say so. We don't really, we don't really settle that debate. Okay. Um, well, so these are actually when we estimate, when we estimate, we do have constraints on being on land in Anatolia. This is just simulated from. These are like the Monte Carlo simulations. Um, but yeah, we, we actually did impose in different versions constraints that they also have used, like, hey, this city is clearly to the west or to the north of Kanesh. And um, in fact, you never hit the uh, boundary, the constraints, so they do seem to make sense. OK, now this is uh, what I was mentioning. Uh, within this data set, 15 known cities lose them at a time, one at a time. Reestimate the whole thing to find the location of that city. Basically, the takeaway is if a city is large and central, you identify it pretty well. 
If it is smallish and peripheral, um, it can shift quite a bit. So these guys just play musical chairs and, and switch their locations. Again, the better, uh, I think, uh, proof of concept is from the modern day data that, that we used, which has a lot less zeros as well, so you get more variation. So I want to finish with, with, uh, with the city sizes. Two results. Are the city size distributions persistent? We find that large cities back then within this system tend to be large now. So it's, it's the answer is yes. We do observe a persistence. And what explains that, not so much the very local fundamentals like crop yield, mineral deposits, rivers, and elevation, but rather this intersection of, of natural roads, the road knots that I mentioned at the beginning. So what do we do? We match these places to modern day locations, either the population of districts, uh, there are about 900 of them, so towns basically, uh, within 20 kilometers of, uh, of a radius around our point estimate. Or uh, for income, we, uh, we use the uh, proxy um, for, uh, uh, from night lights. So we can draw a 20 kilometer radius around the point estimates and add up the total night lights um, in that region. Why 20 kilometers? Um, the known cities uh, tend to be, if they have moved just down the plain or down the river, they tend to be around 10 to kilometers away from modern large towns. So it seems like Throughout history, when they moved in the, in the broader region, in the narrower region, they moved about 10 to 20 kilometers. Plus, the point estimates are, I just point estimates, uh, there are continuous intervals around them. Uh, that's why we cast the net a little bit wide. So this is the correlation with respect to population, log city size here, uh, ancient city size here, and the log modern city size here. Now, this is... Um, Given how sort of independent these things are, we get about 15% of the variation explained with this uh, 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 statistically significant um, slope. Weighted is actually a, a, a better with, a fit if you weight the observations by their, say, um, ancient population. Now, the key thing, key thing here that I mentioned is, again, we, we cannot explain all the shocks that has happened throughout 4,000 years. One example is, right, cities rise and fall for various reasons. One example is, I, we omitted a, um, an outlier here, which would have been way out here. And that is basically a modern shock. There is a city that is very close to modern day capital of the country, which has become the capital in the 20th century for uh, historical reasons that had to do with, with sort of military uh, uh, advantages um, in the formation of the republic. So Ankara is actually here. So there are throughout history shocks that, that make some cities grow or vanish and not come back again. Right? So going forward, some of the regressions are 24 cities dropping Ankara and some others, uh, when it makes sense, we, we include that location as well. I'll show you more. This is with the night lights. Again, this being a proxy of, of income, you get a very similar fit to ancient city size. Again, we don't know to, how, to what extent this is population versus wage, um, which is also a function of productivity and population. So we have two measures here for, uh, from modern day data that proxy for those two components. These are the univariate fits that I showed you, the univariate regressions. It holds when you control for crop yield, which is positively related, as one would suspect. So right, the, 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 the worry here would be there is something uh, invariant, time invariant that is important, such as crop yield, some, some local fundamental that would explain this correlation. It still holds when you control for it. We tried other fundamentals like proximity to river, mineral deposits. They are either not robust or not significant. This system actually fits the Zipps law uh, the, the distribution of city sizes quite well, so you would expect. So basically, uh, 
the sort of the, the distribution of, of many things follow this empirical regularity, uh, like count of words and, and books and whatnot. With city sizes similar, this largest city is twice the size of the second largest city, thrice the size of the third largest city. When you take logs, it's, uh, it's basically a fit of, of, of one. We do fit this, this univariate regression coefficient. We use this as the, uh, as the fit of population and run sort of the standard uh, Zipf's law test and uh, find quite a bit of um, uh, very close to what you would expect and, and what you observe in modern day data sets. So now the last thing is what explains um, these ancient city sizes. So they are quite persistent. Um, what explains city sizes, say, back then and now? So we learned about this hypothesis uh, from our co-author um, coming from a 19th century uh, amateur historian and, uh, and a theologian who basically was looking at biblical, lost biblical cities. So he, he walked around in the entire Mesopotamia, uh, Levant, and Anatolia. While doing that, he found Roman roads and like the mile markers of Roman roads or just the stones of Roman roads. And he developed a theory that, that large cities, this actually is Kanesh, large cities tend to be, um, or he observed that large cities tend to be in the intersection of those roads. So he called this the, the road knot hypothesis. Ramsey's road knot hypothesis, this is, this is from his book. Now, of course, the uh, endogeneity is that roads are endogenous, right? Are cities following roads or roads are just connecting large cities? Or if you have a large city, you can just kind of radiate from it in many directions. So for that reason, this is the modern reincarnation of Ramsey's. Uh, so basically, a modern scholar did chart all the Roman roads and milestones in, in Anatolia. We use the digitized version of this, count the intersections uh, uh, of all our uh, 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 cities, the, the intersection of number of roads radiating out of all, all of our cities. So each city has at least two. If you have no intersection, it's just a road crossing through, so like a ray of two rays. A T-way intersection would be three. Uh, the max is uh, Kanish is one of the highest for um, five intersections around here. So to overcome this endogeneity concern, we did simulate natural roads. So you can think of this as, actually people have been using this kind of idea as an IV for existing roads, or using old roads as an IV for, for new roads. So here we take the exogenous component by using a well-known uh, formula from geography, sort of a, a calorific cost of walking over terrain, so increasing in slope. And we, we learned this from, from, from another uh, historian that was part of our, of our research group broadly. Um, think of this as just taking the topography, take randomly initial and terminal points, and find the least cost path between the two. Um, we did this not just in Anatolia, but actually in the greater geographical region. And the reason is, uh, roads are not just connecting local places, right? They also connect long distance places. And human beings have been walking and trading or migrating over the course of history. So we did this in a, in a different uh, levels of aggregation. Entire continent, uh, smaller scale fractal scales at the local, um, and took various uh, averages of those. Oh, so we used river crossings, like fords. Um, we used unpassable, um, like gorges and so on. I wouldn't mind. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so we basically drew uh, lots of initial and terminal points, found the roads connecting them over geography, and then for each city, we came up with a natural road score, which is the number of intersections of those roads within 20 kilometers. Okay. So this is the heat map of, of the roads. Um, you can kind of tell the hot points of intersections. It's, it's masking a lot of variation, uh, but here is a key path. This is, this is there are mountains here, so you go along the river here. 
we did allow for some coastal navigation if you are coming from from the north so we did this under various scenarios uh, the interior is pretty robust like when you play with the details maybe where you embark into Anatolia uh, differs a bit but all these paths pretty much go into either valleys here river crossings um, and so on so when you overlay Roman roads to this it overlaps pretty well modern roads main arteries of modern roads do follow ancient roads pretty well um, so that bit of course could be both path dependence and the unchanging um, fundamentals and in a sense you can think of technology as something that, that helps you to overcome uh, these constraints right you can actually cross rivers at different points if you have the technology you can build a viaduct if you have the technology so obviously modern roads do um, deviate from these to the extent that they can overcome them, tunnels and so on so this is the uh, fit of these ancient city sizes to the natural roads so here we have about 22 percent um, variation picked up with a significant slope And this, after we control for, for other potential uh, um, local factors. Again, I'm only showing you the thing that robustly did matter. Um, Roman roads, not so much. As a, as it was also a weak instrument, actually, uh, for the whole thing. But um, what we think as a next project is to kind of take this to other geographies, to other time periods, or maybe even to modern day data, and see to what extent we can explain roads in the world with the natural roads and then look at the location and sizes of cities so something that we learned from this geography from this episode uh, is potentially applicable to anywhere in the world and it could also be informed by um, whether your geography is flat and monotonous like maybe in a flat plain there are so many roads you can take there are many uh, paths you can take Whereas in more mountainous regions like, like eastern uh, uh, Turkey, there are valleys that pretty much dictate. So it's also a function of, um, of the geography. You can also think of rivers as roads here, right? Uh, port cities are like that. They're, in a sense, intersection of, of, of paths of least resistance. What's the measure of natural road? Natural road is the number of intersections uh, within 20 kilometers of a point estimate from our simulation. So it should be actually crossroads maybe. The natural road should be crossroads. Why does Wellingness increase city size? It could be, so this is ancient city size. Um, and one conjecture, conjecture is that it is a good defensive location. And ruggedness here could be you are in a slope, right? There could be a um, there could be a plane down there. There could be one area within 20 kilometers that has, um, say, a food base, but ruggedness is kind of how easy it is to, to defend that location. I mean, again, it's, it's important to actually, like here, um, one worry would be that we are just finding things at valleys, right? Like, like again, I if it is just uh, uh, there's so many places, there are so few places that you can actually have cities in a certain region that would be kind of cheap, right? You would, you would simulate both the natural road uh, or its intersection uh, somewhere out just in the outlet of the valley, but it would just be a pure function of, of the topography, the local topography. So that's about it. Um, so as I said, going forward, I would be happy to talk about merchants, uh, other cities, other stories that, that you may know um, uh, about why certain cities are where they are. But um, that's, that's basically. Uh, Is it the same as the other times? I mean, we, we should probably follow up. Uh, but about 12,000 are already digitized. Um, I guess they do. Um, what people do is when they excavate a site and found tablets, they publish it. So they've been published in books, 
I think a lot of those have been digitized from those books, either by historians or by Google. Um, but it's, it's not the entire existing data set. I honestly don't have a great insight into the selection there, what fraction, what, what subsample of existing tablets have been digitized. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a good question. Yes? I don't have a question. I just wanted to tell you and others here that my late father was a professor of ancient languages and civilization at the University of Chicago. <coughs> he deciphered clay tablets yes. all his life right. and published them. Yeah, so and so his name was Duderbach, and he, I noticed one of your students is Hatice, yeah. the Lamasu Hatice. Yeah, Hatice. Which is later the name of the right. of the Hittite Empire, but this is pre Hittite, I understand. That's right. So And yes, this project started like seeing these tablets in the Oriental Institute ah. at the University of Chicago. Really? So, yeah. thank, thanks to your the late father. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just had a question about the weighted people. Is, is, that, uh, is that represent the number of intersections? No. No, these were just the summation of least cost paths. Yeah, that's so you can eyeball intersections here, um, yeah. where they tend to right the, the main main arteries. Of size, yeah, the the oh, so this is already. It doesn't distinguish the fifteen from the ten, um, right? We could superimpose only the ten. But this argument was more for the locations, but uh, sorry, for sizes. Yeah. But of course, um, locations do matter because. Right. Right. We, we, yeah. Um, you can have bubbles, I guess, for the size of the key yeah. proportion. So circles often occur because they're locations often. Yeah. 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 Everybody's hungry. Apparently not a lot, um, more, more so in the coasts when uh, like alluvial silk has yeah, moved a like city like Ephesus, right, used to be a port. Apparently, uh, again, this is why that 20 kilometer radius does make sense. If, if, si if a river has moved locally, it probably didn't move drastically. Um, and the same for agricultural yields. Um, Iron ore, uh, the mineral ores, like it's it's in many cases it's the ores that we know today. So maybe we've discovered it with, with modern technology, but the propensity of coming across to that ore in that region, if it is in abundance, was high in the past as well. The same thing with we use the uh, low input, low fertilizer, low irrigation version of the food and agriculture organization uh, yield data. Something that resembles old technology. And apparently, I mean, 4,000 years is long, but it's not that long from the perspective of the world's uh, main topographical features. Do you have any way from going from your normalized population of Tanish at 100 uh -huh. to any estimate of what the actual populations are in the uh, Just the Zips law that I, it's all relative, right? Not in levels. But it's all relative. So that Zips law was using the fitted, the fit of modern day populations right. to ancient city sizes and thinking, okay, this is the part of the variation that is captured by population. Let's use that. <coughs> Nothing about levels again. It's all logs, relatives. Uh, Kanish was uh, about 10,000 people, apparently, which was huge for its time. Again, that data is very unsystematic and. Um, for most cities, just not available how many people there were. But um, a town of 1,000 people, where 1,000 people were not engaged in agriculture, was considered a settled a town. Right. Yes? In this scale, what is the fact that the Zips law fit on the first analytical curve? It's usually the higher end, right? Right. The, yeah. Yeah, so we do miss the top two. Um, I mean, there is a, there's a literature in archaeology that goes back about 30 years that you know, 
like that was just like the eyeball reading uh-huh. thing. And one of the sorts of post coke explanations that is often offered for that occurred with that kind of lack of sort of the top is that you're looking at uh, a se- at a non integrated system or actually perhaps several different coding systems, right? That that just draw mm. a five say yes. say of a I see. a single economic entity or political entity, but uh, one way to diagnose the delusion of setting that's got multiple independent polities operating in it. So this is not that different from like the struggle in the modern day data how to define the boundaries of a city. Like what is the boundary of New York? Uh, or some huge metropolitan areas. Um, so that actually is something that people do play with to, to kind of come up with challenges or, um, so it is kind of similar. Like maybe two places that were 30 kilometers apart from each other were just part of two settlements of one entity. Right, right. yeah, it's, it's. So. Can I have uh, a reference for that from you? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll please. Katya? It's not a, but it's it's not a obvious constraint, right? Like uh, whether a lost city should be close to a large city today, like there's no theoretical reason okay. for having that that constraint. We don't. Like lit it freely. So the only constraints we have are related to the trade going on. Something is clearly to the west of Kanesh or north of Kanesh, but that that I mean, uh, that that wouldn't make sense, right? Why why do we? Why do we bias the estimation to, to push it close to modern day cities? We find that, well, in some cases, that's what they um, come up with. But in some other cases, they actually uh, uh, propose a site, like a, a, a ruin, an ancient site, as, as that city. Oh, there are thousands, so, so unknown, unnamed sites, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. So that would be a, right, so that would be a, a challenging. What we did instead is, for each city, we did publish in the appendix the probability uh, of the 10 nearest sites that are unnamed, the names, and the probability of each of them being that city. So we did do it sort of individually. Right. That explains why the uh, known ones are known. Like in many cases, they've been inhabited a little bit past this time period, if not up until today, which is the case for some and say they've been observed say around year zero or year thousand and the name kind of changed slowly so they can track those things. The, the, this, these are all well-known facts, like the, the known cities, we take them as sort of multiple history. Some of them are undisputed. Just there was like a welcome to Kanesh sign. That's undisputed. In some cases, if there's any room for debate, we took a sort of unambiguously multiple historians sort of the mainstream agreeing with that. So there are multiple references for you know, that city being that location. Um, in many cases, why it's not disputed is related to the fact that it somehow survived a longer time period. It was named, uh, a city that was Vashashuna was named as like Vashushana or something, like slightly changed, say, a thousand years later, and there's a record of it, so then that's it. The names throughout history do reveal um, hints to, to historians. In very few cases, they were like Kanesh, they were continuously inhabited, and those ruins were well known, very close to a large city throughout history. That was always a regional center. Yeah, so the, some of the large cities actually, we did use whether they were um, centers of emirates or uh, sort of regional centers of, of empires in between. There's a correlation there as well. They did 
stay as, as important um, centers throughout <coughs> history. Thank you.